Well, good morning once again to you. Thank you for joining me, uh, Nathaniel, here. And if I didn't get a chance to say hello to you before, thank you very much for, uh, for doing that. And I'd love to say hello to you later. If you uh, want to follow along today as in the Bible as we hear God's Word, you can certainly pull out your own electronic or, or paper, whatever you'd like. But if you have one of these white Bibles in your pews, we're on page 978 if you want to look at that as well. Let's uh, take a moment and pray as we ask God to send us His Holy Spirit and we hear His Word this morning. God, the Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that you would send us the Holy Spirit this morning so that we might hear your word with true and right hearts and so believe it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week we took a look at the unbelievable strength that faith has. It's, it's a truth, it's a reality that to face the challenges of our daily life, we need some strength. Uh, a lot of us, you know, we, we just we need strength in a lot of areas of life. And we, we, the reality also is that we can't do life on our own strength. Uh, it's, it's when we give up our own strength, when we become weak and we take on the strength of Jesus Christ that he gave up as he became weak, that we will finally become strong. Our strength does not make us strong. It's our weakness, actually, that makes us strong. And, and today, then, he moves on to tell us something else that's unbelievable about faith. But let's get into that. Now, James starts out today by telling us this. He says very straightforwardly, believers must not show favoritism. Believers must not show favoritism, which seems pretty straightforward to us, uh, but is really quite shocking, quite surprising, and, and, and quite wonderful. Um, if you had lived about the time of James, this might have been something common that you heard. This is from a man named Aristotle, who is one of the greatest thinkers in the West. And in one of his first books on politics, he wrote this. He said that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. Slavery is both expedient and right. Wow, can you believe somebody, somebody argued that? And not just somebody, but one of the greatest thinkers the world has ever known? Aristotle was, was arguing that slavery is part of life, and you can tell who should be slaves from the moment they're born. You think, wow, uh, we, we have certainly made it, thankfully, quite a long ways since that point. And a big part of that, a big part of that has to do with what James said. We shouldn't show favoritism. We shouldn't show partiality. Now, that's not to say that Christians have always gotten it right or have done really well when it comes to fairness. Uh, have you heard of the concept of nepotism? You know of the idea of nepotism? Uh, nepotism was practiced by a number of popes during the early, early medieval times. And nepotism consisted in the popes and also a lot of other leaders at that time, most of whom said that they were Christians, placing their nephews into positions of religious power. They would, they would place their own nephews into positions of spiritual leadership and influence. They would, say, take a nephew and, and put them over a city, make them a governor over a city or a state. Uh, they would take a nephew. One took a, a 14 and a 16-year-old nephew and made them cardinals. Cardinals in the Roman Catholic Church, some of the most important people, a 14 and a 16-year-old, not because they had skills or abilities for the job, but simply because they were relatives. If that's not an example of partiality, of favoritism, I'm not sure what is. And so Christians, we have our own uh, pretty bad examples, pretty bad mistakes when it comes to showing favoritism, and we've practiced it plenty ourselves. Uh, but I still think that we would all agree fairness is the better way. Fairness is the right way. That doesn't mean that fairness is easy or that fairness even always puts us in a good place. Uh, I have a, a couple of pictures here, and I want you to tell me which one is best, okay? Which one of these is best? The first is uh, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night, 
And the second one is uh, Picasso's Guernica. Guernica. I always struggle pronouncing that one. So which one of these pictures is best? First, you've got Picasso's Starry Night. Second, Guernica from, or, uh, from Picasso. Which one's best? Now, I'm sure if I asked you your preference, that'd be an easy question, wouldn't it? But if I ask you which one's best, you'd say, well, we're not, we're not art experts. You know, I'm not an art critic. How do I know which one's best? What, what's, the, what's the values? What's the criteria that I use to assess which one's better and which one's best? And you know what? Professional art critics have even said the same thing. They've said, sure, we live in a world that says equality, fairness is most important. But that doesn't fix everything. An art critic back in 2011 said this. He said that, um, he said that there was no way to establish any art criteria. No one had the right to say that this art was good and this, that art was bad. You hear him saying, he's saying, you have no real basis for deciding which of these pictures is best. You're stuck. Now, what he's talking about is postmodernism, and that's a, a complicated thing. But as soon as we are asked to judge which piece of art is best, we realize that fairness is not always helpful. I mean, who doesn't, who wants to live in a world where we can't argue anymore whether the Spartans or the Wolverines are better? Who wants to live in a world where we can't argue whether, whether the Trojans and the Bulldogs are, are best? Or Dean's ice cream versus Plainwell ice cream? That, that's not a world that I want to live in. So fairness is good, equality is good, um, but it, 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 if it leaves us in a world without good and bad, then fairness is not enough. And what James wants to tell you this morning is that there is something better than fairness. There is something better for us to live by than fairness. And all the kids right now, they should be perking up and thinking to themselves, wait a second, there's something better than fairness? So you're telling me that when mom and dad and my, my sibling and I, we go to grandma's and grandma makes 12 cookies, there's a way for me to get more than my fair share? I can get more than three? And I'm saying yes. And James says yes. There's something better in life than fairness. And let's see what that is. So James, he starts out and he says this, uh, verse 5, he puts it this way. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? Now, I realize that saying God has chosen the poor is not the same as saying God rejects the rich, God hates the rich, God wants to get rid of the rich. No, God has, has chosen the poor, and yet it, it still says that, doesn't it? Now, this is a hard thing. All of us have grown up in a world, in a life that says, treat everybody equally. Everybody is fair. Everybody is, is on the same ground. If you've got a rich person and a poor person in front of you, you treat them the same. Then God says, I've chosen the poor. And then look at history. Uh, the history of Christianity tells us that God consistently chooses the people of lower socioeconomic status. In the last 50 years, go look up, where has Christianity grown the most? It's grown in Latin America, in Asia, and in Africa. That's where Christianity has grown. And what about in your own life? I can tell you that from firsthand experience you know, in my life, I don't have as many gospel conversations with people who have nice houses on Gun Lake and Gull Lake as I do with people who have just lost their job, lost their home, and lost their car, and they're calling church and they're saying, hey, you know, can you help me out? Those are the people that I talk about the gospel with more. Now, I realize some of you live on Gun Lake, right? You live on Gull Lake. We're friends. I'm your pastor. I, I love you. Uh, and, and I'm in the exact same boat as you. I, I've, I've really never been hungry for more than, say, 36 hours gone without food. 
you know, I've, I've been homeless for maybe a couple weeks at a crack, but I've always had somebody's couch that I could sit, sleep on. I, I'm in the same place. And then I read here that it says that God has chosen the poor. And I realize for God, the gospel is not theoretical. It, it's not just a nice idea. You know, a poor person, they say that they're wrecked that they're broken, they're, they're a disaster. That poor person knows that beyond a house and a car and other good things in life, that they also have a lot of other things that, that they don't have. They don't have maybe the reputation that they'd like to have. They don't have a, a good name. They don't have integrity or, or goodness, or maybe even they don't have uh, the kind of identity that they'd like to have. Right? They're a wreck. They're a disaster. And then God says, but you, you are more important to me. You're valued higher than you could ever imagine, poor person, because of Jesus. You have value, you have worth that you don't have to accomplish. You don't have to work for. The the gospel is not theoretical at all for, for that poor person. And this is so important for God. God says that in in verse 9 of this lesson today, that if you and I show favoritism, that we're breaking the law. He puts us right next to murderers and adulterers. And and you think, wait a second, you're telling me that if I pick my best friends when we play baseball to be on my team, that that I'm like as bad as a murderer? I mean, that doesn't seem fair, is it? And what God just says over and over is, Love your neighbor as yourself. God never says to you, I'm going to put you on equal ground. God never says to you and to me, I'll give you a good shot to make it. God says, I'm going to put you on the winning team. God says to you, I'll I'll take a loser and I'm going to make you a winner. I'll take the worst of the worst and I'm going to make you the best and you don't have to do a thing for it. Uh, there was a, a man named Matt Chandler who told a really kind of funny story that made this point. Uh, he was in college and playing intramural flag football, rec team leagues, right? Uh, and, and he and his friends were terrible football players, but they were great soccer players. And so they just outran everybody. That's how they kept winning. They won game after game in their rec league of this flag football uh, until they got to the game where they had to play the rec league staff. And they thought, well, this game should be easy. They got decimated, blown out. The rec league staff, they only had one athlete. His name was Mitch Abels. But Mitch Abels was this phenomenal athlete. Uh, they, he said at one point in the game, Matt did, he said that Mitch somehow threw himself a 30-yard pass uh, for completion. You know, two men in the zone, two men right on him, and somehow he got a 30-yard pass completed to himself. To this day, he doesn't remember a single other player on that rec league team. But Mitch Abels, he lifted the whole team up to victory. And that's what God does for you and for me. He doesn't say, oh, I'll give you a fair shot. You know, you can play on the team. He says, look, I'm going to take a whole bunch of of losers and I'll put you on the team and I'm going to make you all winners. You can win with Jesus more than you've ever imagined. I'll give you success and victory. I will open up the doors of heaven. I will give you righteousness and a good name. I will give you everything that counts in life. You can have it all with Jesus. That's what God is saying to us. And he says, now, if I've made you a winner, go and make other people win too. Go and show them mercy. And and so what we can say out of today is that, sure, right? Fair is fine, but mercy is so much more in life. What's better than fairness? You can hear it in verse 13 where where God makes the point. He, He drives it home. He says, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What's he saying? Fair is fine. Fair is a good way to play life. But there's something better. Mercy. Mercy is so much more. And you and I, you know, we need to take this to heart today, don't we? 
Some of you are, are baby Christians. You're just trying out the gospel. And, and thank you. Thank you for the encouragement that you give to us. Thank you for being a symbol uh, of hope, for, for being the example that we see today to say mercy is more. You're a trophy. You're telling us mercy really is better. For all of us, this means, this means something more. You know, it starts with simple things, doesn't it? It means that when we come to church, we talk to people who we aren't friends with and maybe don't even want to be friendly to. Uh, we, we, we take the time to say, good morning, friend. It's, I'm happy to see you. I'm going to go talk to these other people, despite the fact that we maybe don't always get along, and I'm going to do it without judging them or criticizing them. I'm going to show them mercy. Now, this is, this is a hard thing. All right, I, I love you, and this is something tough. We've got to all do this together. Because it means so much more than that, doesn't it? It goes way beyond those basics. Have you ever done one of these, these optical illusions? I'm sure we have all have at, at one time or another. And of course, if, you, if we stare at this optical illusion for maybe 10 minutes or so, you're going to start to see uh, the face of Jesus in it if you look at the wall. It's a pretty great thing. Now, this is actually comes out of a scientific experiment from an Italian scientist named Caputo. Caputo, he, he took some 40 people and he put them in a room and he all made them stare at each other for a while. And after 10 minutes, he, he said, what did you start to see? And he said, well, when I was staring at the other person, um, for everybody, the other person's face started to get distorted. Some people actually started to see monsters in the other person's face. Uh, some people started to see... Uh, their relatives and their friends in the other person's face. And some people saw themselves. They just looked at the other person and they saw themselves. That's what happens if you stare at something like this for long enough. And that happens through a process called dissociation. You, you dissociate the person's face from their body, from their actual physical face. See, at the belie- beginning of this lesson, when God says believers must not show favoritism. The word favoritism is literally to receive somebody's face. You must not receive somebody's face as as something special to you and me. What God wants from us, he says from us, is here's a face, the face of Jesus. And you can stare at that face all day long. Here's a face of true mercy. The face of Jesus is sacrifice for you for everything that you have ever lost. It's payment for everything that you have ever done wrong. And when you stare at that face, you can get so filled up with it, right? It'll seep into your eyes, into your body, that when you look at anybody else, you'll no longer really see them. You'll just see the face of Jesus. The face of Jesus is the only face that's going to tell you that you are are so loved and not make you pity or despise other people. You and I, if we look at our friends, if we look at our relatives, we we know that we're loved. We we feel loved by looking at people that like us and, and we like them back. It's a great connection to experience with them but then if we if we see that person so much and we've got that face stuck in our minds when we look at somebody who's poor and needy and helpless we think how come you're not like my friend why don't you why don't you love me why do i have to love you why do i have to give so much to you and and if if you and i spend all our time looking at the poor and the needy well then we start to think to ourselves why are you like that why can't you fix yourself why why is your life so much like that But if you look at the face of Jesus, you see a face of a man who loved you without end and who is poor and needy and helpless. And his face will fill you with a a call to mercy, a desire for mercy that will just roll out of you to every person in your life. 
the most compassionate, the most gracious, the most loving people, they don't spend all of their time thinking about who they need to help or how much more money they need to make in order to help other people. They think about who Jesus is and, and the face that gave up life for them. And when you fill yourself with that face, when your eyes are filled with that face, you will be so filled with the mercy of God that you won't be able to stop showing mercy to other people. You'll live the truth that fairness is a fine thing, but mercy, mercy is so much more. Can we pray for that, please? Heavenly Father, you inspired James to hold nothing back this morning. He just let us have it. And for people who are sometimes so shallow and superficial and always judging life on the basis of what we see and, and what we want, that's pretty hard. Forgive us. Fill us with the face of Jesus so that we know how much mercy you have shown to us. Fill us with that life so our lives overflow with mercy to the people around us. Make us merciful as you have shown us mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.